two people. Um, and I have to say that in my experience, I have rarely met two professionals like Helen Sloan and David Cotter. Helen is an excellent curator. She did an amazing job when she came to Istanbul. I have gorgeous photographs of the exhibition that I need to give you. <laughs> and, uh, and we're working in preparing the, the catalog. With David Cotterell, he exhibited his work at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Zagreb. He's a well-known artist and professor, and he teaches at Sunderland. Sheffield. Sheffield, sorry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and I have to say, he has been one of the most understanding <laughs> artists um, during ICEA 2011, which was uh, you know, a pretty big endeavor. And in very large endeavors, usually you don't have, uh, uh, you know, you cannot dedicate yourself very much to all the different artists, so you have to sacrifice some time. And uh, we're now preparing the catalog that is called These Locations, and I have decided to have, uh, there is almost 50 images of uh, uh, the work in there. It has been a very hard selection, it has taken us around 15 days to get down because I was almost thinking of having 100 of them. Anyway, he did an amazing series of works that are focusing on war, um, the relationship in a way and the forms and methodology of representation. So I'm not going to be talking much longer about it and I would let you uh, listen to uh, an interview and discussion if you wish between Ellen and David about the relationship as artist and curator around this team. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I'd like to start, I mean I think it's a very interesting juxtaposition that we have with Neem and the work that we're about to present in that it's coming from two very different perspectives. I think one from someone who is immersed in a culture and a culture that has you know, that has, has, worked with, has worked alongside conflict over a number of years, and then someone who's coming from Britain and visiting Afghanistan, which is what we're going to focus on now, and, and the experiences that one feels with that, and, and the kinds of responses that one makes in terms of um, the military being present and occupying um, Afghanistan uh, in terms of the British. So I'm going to start just by saying that, um, as Glenn Franco says, I'm Helen Sloan, I'm Director of SCAN, and I was approached by the Arts Council to work with David um, around a particular residency that he had at a company called Seos, which is now uh, being bought out by Rockwell Collins, and that was a flight simulation and balance projection company. So what David had been brought in to do was to research and uh, uh, to have a sort of two-way research process with the people with the people working within the company and his own ideas and to create a number of new installations and new pieces of work around that. And the whole idea was that the research was equitable so that it was equal across both both sides. Now that uh, as you might imagine, um, one of the one of the uh, um, one, one of the one of, one of the uh, major clients of, uh, of, of, of SEOS was the military. And what also had happened a little while earlier was that, um, tell me if I'm getting any of this wrong, I'm sort of speaking for you, but uh, what had happened a little while earlier was that, that David had gone out twice to Afghanistan in two very different, which we'll talk about in a minute, two very different contexts. And somehow it made absolute sense that these two things needed to merge and a body of work needed to come out of them. So I wanted to sort of start from that period and also to say that from now until the exhibition that we're going to talk about, that's at the John Hansard Gallery, um, David and I have had this fantastically luxurious relationship of being able to develop a show over a period of three years, which doesn't happen very often for curators. Um, for me, it's been a really, really interesting and rewarding uh, process. So just just start as a little bit of background. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Absolutely. Okay. All right. I'll, um, so um, so starting with Afghanistan and um, your experiences there, I'd just like you to give a little bit of background to that we you know the it's trauma and memory we're focusing on. So maybe talk a little bit about both those things. Yeah. I mean, I 
think it's quite important, particularly following your presentation, that there was no pretension to understand Afghanistan or to become an expert on conflict as an outsider. No. Um, the experience of being sent as a war artist from Britain is generally an experience of kind of heightened awareness of what it's like to be an external observer to the suffering of others, rather than a kind of a, 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 a development of a, an expertise in something which is so far beyond the comprehension. But I was sent to Afghanistan because of the Welcome Trust, who during a hiatus in the Imperial War Museum War Artist Project had decided that it was a good time to try and um, persuade the Ministry of Defence to allow access to the medical chain, which at the time was still embargoed for journalists. It was still seen as unpalatable to show British service people injured, although you were allowed to show other nationalities injured at the time on broadcast media. So after two years of neg negotiation, they managed to get permission to send one artist in using the historic form of war artist rather than journalist. And um, I was invited to see if I could ethically justify taking up that role. So after some soul searching, I decided that if I was going to be a, an armchair critic of war, it would be hard to reconcile myself with never having tested those assumptions when given the opportunity. I went for a month to Helmand province with a field hospital regiment and then forward to Sangin with 40 commando. And after being stranded for a while, returned back to meet my students, realised that I wasn't really able to reconcile these two radically different experiences and uh, managed to find a way to return six months later as a civilian with um, support from the RSA and others to get onto a UN flight and travel across the north um, without the military escort in a completely different environment. The important thing for me, I suppose, from both of these was um, recognising the limitations of prior empathy in that I had attempted in a relatively sensitive, I thought, thoughtful way to try and constantly make myself aware of the political repercussions of our country and of the remote circumstances where conflicts happen. But I realised that despite having seen a vast number of images moving and still of conflicts, that I was entirely unprepared for seeing anything of the reality of the aftermath of violence. And I probably would have experienced something of that shock being a Newcastle general or in a casualty ward in Britain because I hadn't really had a great deal of experience of seeing operations happen in civilian life, but possibly heightened because of the abstraction, because of the impossibility to contextualise what I was looking at in terms of my previous life. It remained unresolved and difficult to accommodate. And so I suppose the, the return trip was an attempt to try and see how, how I had looked or how the people around me had looked from outside. So walking along a street and seeing an armoured convoy race by while not in uniform was a very useful experience. And trying to get a sense of how the world looked from within the military bubble and how that was immediately contradicted as soon as you stepped out of it was helpful. So I don't know if that's enough of an introduction. But I think it would be useful for you to elaborate on on that contrast, you know, you talk about the military bubble. Tell us a little bit about what the military bubble was like. Well, I suppose there are two ways to deal with um, difficult environments. One is to protect yourself massively. Use body armour, take weapons with you, and make sure that you're surrounded by people that are very efficient at, at defending you. Um, but that does make you quite conspicuous. And when travelling through a landscape, if, you're, if somebody's conducting a risk assessment for you and you're travelling with some kind of defensive structure like an armoured vehicle or um, a squad of soldiers, then I suppose while you, you're probably kind of mitigating for the risk, you're also <coughs> making it impossible to ever get beyond the division of society between those that um, are on one side and those are on the other. It's very clear when you wear body armour that you perceive everybody who's not wearing body armour as a personal threat which suggests that you're suspicious of them and you don't trust their intentions. It's also kind of difficult when you're travelling in an environment where you're hosted by an organisation, at least my transport was covered by the Ministry of Defence. It was a... I didn't own my own risk, and I was essentially the risk to the Ministry of Defence. The embarrassment of losing a war artist in conflict is quite high for them, and they, it meant that when I wasn't censored, I wasn't really able to feel that I was totally in control of my own judgement as to what I would decide was worth seeing. Stepping outside that, growing a beard, learning a few lines in Dari, and, and trying to take language lessons in Afghanistan, 
meeting students in Galway University and then travelling by taxi. <clears throat> in some ways I felt less at risk than I would do wearing a helmet and body armor, because although not physically protect, protected by Kevlar, I also had lost something of the immediate simple kind of um, stereotype which suggested how people should react to me. And I think that level of reinventing some form of complexity into the relationship offered possibly um, a different way of engaging. In fact, there, there are other stereotypes, such as mem distant memories of hippies travelling across the north, and that kind of thing, which would be used by some people to try and uh, understand why it was that something turned up in this house in the present form. So. But, but there were things that began to emerge, especially on the second trip, in terms of your, um, in terms of your visit. Um, so you talked a little bit about NGOs and um, and the role that they played in having a dialogue with um, with Afghani people, but they were still protected, and they were, you know, they were, there was still a sort of barrier between them. That you, as an artist, because you were less valued, you weren't being on the second trip. Mm. It's almost like you you didn't matter so much. So you were able to go and talk to people in a way that you weren't able to talk elsewhere. And this is something that came out as the sort of role of a potential role of the artist or, or something else, you know, whatever that might be, yeah. in terms of in terms of creating that dialogue. Um, I think I think any artist that undertakes a residency of any form goes through some kind of anxiety as to whether you're being a tourist um, to the community that you're supposed to be working with or observing. And that can happen in Sunderland or in Afghanistan. But I think it was it was interesting that um, I suppose there was a great deal of guilt for travelling the first time round, and there was an attempt to try and um, kind of step outside that, that voyeuristic experience and see if I could kind of contextualise myself, my role as an artist, and if I could somehow justify the role of an artist in that role. Because I was there as an observer in the first trip, and there was a what I hadn't realised when I got there was that most of the patients and doctors involved in in these kind of extraordinarily traumatic moments in their lives actually wanted documentation because prior to that there wasn't really a great deal of infrastructure for documenting their experience which they knew would probably still remain to be one of the most important in their lives for many years to come. So there was a, there was a, a general sense for them it was justified to have somebody as a neutral observer. Um, but for me holding a camera trying to record the impact on other people's lives that I couldn't possibly comprehend unless it happened directly to me. There was a problem with kind of trying to understand why it was that I still believed that somehow it was useful to have an artist there rather than somebody in the more conventional role as the combat camera crew, the military photographers, or the journalist role. And I came to believe there was a real value in being a layperson. In although there's there's great value in having people that understand the context, making a record and providing a detailed um, kind of comprehensive explanation of, of context in a way that I couldn't. There was also a real value to somebody um, being involved in documenting to provide an additional subjective layer which embraced the shock and the, the complete lack of familiarity with the systems of war, the, the systems of trauma care, the strangeness of having young people still trying to hurt each other in a contemporary world. And kind of, um, and not necessarily, not necessarily being familiar enough with the acronyms, with the with the rules of engagement, and the other systems around me, to have absorbed them and accept them as normal. Watching the NGOs practice, I saw some extraordinary individuals taking massive risks in order to try and do something which they they felt might be justifiable over a long period of time. But I also saw institutional difficulties in that, in that for the Red Cross, for the UN, for any organisation where they have people which they have a duty of care for. Although they weren't wearing body armour, they were still travelling traveling in armoured convoys with bodyguards. And there was still that great difficulty in kind of finding a way in which you can inject new, new people into a discussion or simply kind of allow people to, to traverse debates within the same country with that, and while accepting the fact that they may have to kind of essentially enter a society and become part of the society in order to engage with it, rather than viewing from a distance or from a protected place. Giving that as a sort of background of, of, of some of your thoughts, um, I just wanted to bring one more thing up before we go on to some work. Um, 
when we when we first started talking, um, you were saying that you were having some problems with you, that, you know, having having a kind of uh, dialogue with your peers because they hadn't experienced what what you had, and there were certain expectations of the media. And I've said this before, you know, we, we, we found the point of connection because I'd been out to Chernobyl and had had similar experiences um, when I was curating a show a few years ago. And um, I just just as a starting point, because obviously the work there was a trajectory across the work that we'll discuss in a minute. Can you talk a little bit about those feelings when you got back? There was a I mean I was on both marches against the Afghan wars and the Iraq wars and I've always <coughs> I didn't want to say when I first came back because I didn't want the press response to the welcome show to be simplified by people immediately discounting what was in the show by saying, well, that's not my political view. But um, I wrestled with the difficulty that there was a certain expectation for everyone that knew me that I would come back with a very strong kind of uh, angry statement. And of course, while I'd, I still felt angry, the, the anger was more at the failure of media and language to represent complexity in that by going closer to the point of conflict where people are actually engaged in acts of violence, the, the, it doesn't necessarily prevent, provide a, a heightened sense of clarity. What I found was that by getting, each time I was just desperately trying to progress closer to something which might offer some sort of truth, <coughs> to find out why these, where, where it was these people were coming in from, covered in dust and, and injured. And as the closer I got to it, the more I found that the macro picture, that the, the meta-narratives and the political kind of strategic arguments for war were impossible to, 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 to feel any kind of sense of presence there. It wasn't, it wasn't that they became more plausible, it's just they became irrelevant. And that what I was seeing was random acts of violence, as, at least as far as I was concerned, I was seeing individual moral judgments as to whether they should shoot at each other. And whether that would be recorded in history as being aberrant to the meta narrative or actually a key component in it was something which none of us at that point in the middle of the desert could ever really have any kind of clear understanding of. So when I came back, instead of kind of feeling it was easy to, to rehearse the same kind of statements that I might well have said beforehand, I came back with it with a, a genuine sense that what I had seen was absolute the absolute dislocation between the mediated view of war and the actual experience of conflict and violence, which wasn't such a strong statement. It wasn't. I had a thousand images recorded on my camera of graphic, um, the graphic repercussions of war, <coughs> all of which potentially could be used with the right kind of caption to make quite a strong political statement. Um, but I felt a genuine sense of responsibility to people in the images. I felt. Um, a sense of empathy with individuals which had been caught up in something and only really realised um, the, the enormity of what, how their lives were changing at the moment when their lives were changing. And also recognising the incredible diversity within a community which from the outside looks very similar. And of course soldiers in Britain, although we've been at war every year apart from one since the Second World War, I could quite happily have gone through my life never meeting anybody else that had been in the armed forces apart from my granddad. And I probably, well, not knowingly, because it's something like one in a hundred people in Britain are actually involved in the military. So we can be at war the whole time, and, and yet any uh, kind of understanding of why it is that somebody who's unemployed in, in Wales or <coughs> in, in Liverpool might decide to join up is something where I, I'm naturally going to develop uh, a stereotypical assumption. I'm going to, because they're wearing a uniform, I'm assuming they're a uniform community. And what I saw were people that varied from the the macho kind of extreme that I had expected through to people that had more of a sanguine, almost poetic, kind of melancholic understanding of what was going on around them. And all within the same uniform community, this huge variety, which made it much harder to simply dismiss out of hand as all of the, all of the people involved as being immoral, or all of them being, or, or the whole act being something which was entirely thwarted. I felt that the strong impression was that war in all its guises is tragic, but I also recognised that the images which I had on my laptop didn't actually represent anything of the trauma that I felt, in that that was something which wasn't to do with spectacle, which is possible to kind of transmit over the internet from a, an image on the web or through a, a short bulletin on the news. The actual horror, really, was to do with the mundane banality of conflict, of the fact that 
after the moment of injury, after they, they've had the shots of people firing machine guns in the desert on YouTube, which look very much like they're epitomising war. And what war really epitomises is the 40 years of complete angst of the person being hit by the shell, having to try and rebuild an identity which is radically different without any kind of moment of warning. And that is something which is impossible to transmit through images or through the news. And so as much as I had understood something of the aesthetic of war, I, I somehow managed to forget that, of course, experience is something which is much more time-based. So I was reticent about the use of my images. And in the welcome show, when I came back, I refused to allow any of them to be used in the exhibition, but allowed them to be used with extracts of my diary to contextualize what was in the exhibition. And I think the images which Helen will show is from a second exhibition where I've kind of somehow got over the, the absolute guilt of owning these images by going around and tracing everybody in them in a kind of laborious process of finding all of the people that had been distributed to different healthcare centres in the NHS that were in my pictures and ask them if they wanted the images destroyed. Can I start showing yeah. them then? In all, of, in all of the instances, while I assumed that there'd be a, a variety of responses from whether they want to be anonymised or the images destroyed, because it takes so long to find people, it took me a month to get home and then another month to go out there and kind of feel ready to deal with any of this. It takes the, the soldiers something like six months to progress through to rehabilitation if they get through the initial series of operations, in which case they'll be dispersed throughout the country. By the time I found them, it, for some it was 12 months later, many of the soldiers had no longer uh, felt as if they were in the public eye. They weren't guarding their privacy, but they instead they were, in a way, upset by the anonymity of their injury, the fact that they were returning to society with losing a limb, but actually without anybody around them really understanding why it, or what it meant to them or whether it was... And so they actually wanted to have, have their faces visible and to have these images used. So the, these images we're showing here, a little bit distorted and compressed, but what we're seeing is a selection of a small selection of images which were shown mainly because of the strange artificial nature of the image. Operating theatres are called theatres for a reason, of course, because they have directional light and they were used for, for demonstrations. And theatres aren't theatrical. Um, when surgeons work as a team, it's as if they're choreographed by an invisible choreographer because they're... <coughs> They know each other's actions so well, they anticipate each other's movements, they never bump into each other and they can pass things to each other before anything's verbal has to be said. There's a strange thing when you take a photograph, and I was using a camera to protect myself from the, any kind of emotional connection to what I was looking at, at least I was trying to make sure that the weakness in my face wasn't visible to those around me. What was happening is you formalise what you're looking at through the lens, you can't help composing an image, but also you find that the images which come back are strangely unreal. This image on the left particularly is a bit hard to see on the way on the screen, but it appeared that a kind of a, a mannered narrative portrait, as if I'd gone in there and actually positioned each of the, the players in the scene. And what was surprising to me, I suppose, was that in a way what was the the, the, the least manipulated part of the experience appeared to be the most synthetic and the least realistic. It was the they offered a kind of chiaroscuro kind of sensation of an illustration of somebody else's world rather than any threat to the audiences. And it was interesting for me. And, I mean, you know, you'd also did, did a few things in post-production in terms of puts and contrast and, you know, yeah. the sort of print techniques that we use. It isn't very clear from these these projections, but, I mean, when I first saw the work, they were more like, they were more like paintings. They had a sort of heroic feel to them, almost a sort of religious... Renaissance painting, but rather than um, <coughs> the wall. and I think that was very striking in terms of the way that you produced the prints. I'm now going to go. I'm going to show some some images of the theatre piece that you showed in uh, War and Medicine at the Welcome. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Welcome? Yeah, I can quickly go through it. Well, these images weren't shown in the exhibition, which I was, I felt somehow obliged to try and produce something on my return, despite the fact that there wasn't any great clarity, at least to justify to the um, people around me for, for why they allowed somebody else to be a witness to what was going on in their world. But I was anxious not to simply reproduce the same kind of material that had been shown to me prior to going. I'd been shown some really horrific images by a paratroop medic 
prior to going, and I think he found the worst images on the web that he could find of, of horrific bomb injuries and that kind of thing, and sat me down and kind of enjoyed watching me squirm before I went. And he thought he was conditioning me, which he was, of course, visually, but he hadn't conditioned me for the smell or for the fact that the patients talk, which was a real shock. I, for some reason, I, I'd forgotten that people didn't scream like in Black Hawk Down because they were on morphine, and they weren't all conveniently unconscious. And when one of them was actually negotiating with the doctor about me, that was something of the limitation of the prior injury. So I wanted to try and create a sense of empathy with something of the bleakness of one of the experiences. And theatre is, is a, a five screen simulation in a curved space of um, a kind of panoramic view of inside a C-130 Hercules aircraft fitted for taking intensive care patients back from Camp Bastion to Kandahar, which is a flight that I travelled on. Um, the sound in it is pervasive, it's, it's extremely powerful sound because the sound of the C-130 is. Military aircraft aren't sound insulated at all. So you feel that. You wear earplugs, but the vibrations are something which you'll always remember. And interestingly, the visual quality is very poor in that it's not that it's low resolution, it was 8,000 pixels, but because it was so dark, you'd just see hints of imagery. And your eyes would be searching for anything which offered any kind of visual explanation of what was going on. The experience was one of disorientation, where the sound overwhelmed the image, and the image was strangely unrewarding in that it was showing an hour long an experience of watching doctors doing very little apart from checking their patients. So there was no great conclusion, there was no great heroic act, and it was very dark and quite bleak. What was interesting was that it wasn't real, of course. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. the, the whole fact of it was intervention. Do you think that, I mean, obviously you've talked about your relationship between, between the residencies and the work that you produced, but do you think that had something to do with the residency itself as well? Yeah, since you were surrounded by all these special techniques. The access to SEOS has been through the end of the Artist Fellowship scheme. The Arts Council have been running the scheme for a long time. And at the tail end of it, they decided to experiment with trying to provide fellowships to access kind of territories which were hard to reach, not necessarily geographically, but because of other restrictions. And SEOS being a, a, an aviation simulator was hard to reach because of security clearance. So there was some good fortune for everyone involved when I I'd somehow been vetted for pre-deployment training to go to Afghanistan just before starting it, and it took away some of the risk. And during the, res uh, the residency or access to this, um, this um, facility, which I drop into one day a week, I then, I, during that time, I made the second trip to Afghanistan. So what was going on, I suppose, was I was watching people building with the most incredible hardware, um, a, a spherical simulator for the Eurofighter, which was being prototyped there and then going to be sent out to various places around the world where Eurofighters were sold. And it cost several million pounds to build one of these. And what they were doing, of course, was they, they were putting all of their effort in ingenuity into something which would allow pilots to completely suspend disbelief, despite walking into something which was <coughs> like a, a Second World War you know, water mine. You know, it, once you're inside, it would be impossible for your eyes to really spot the pixels. The, the contrast was so great, it was a half a million to one contrast ratio that it would be impossible for you to see the grey glow of the screen. And they worked with collimation so that your eyes would focus a kilometre away from the screen rather than actually on the surface. All of this was trying to get to the point where pilots could rehearse missions in areas in other parts of the world where they, they probably hadn't been yet. But for me, one of the, the strange aspects of it was that, of course, this vast amount of effort and energy was going into creating it was essentially a sense of empathy, but only for one instrumentalized experience. And it seemed to me a great shame that it wasn't possible for us to invest as much effort in trying to empathize with maybe the experiences which are, are less to do with the military purpose and more to do with the military repercussions. So there was some, there was some overlap influence, I'm sure, although the technology used here was much simpler than the Europe crisis simulator. But, I mean, we'll talk about that a bit later on. You know, You've had to do that all the way through, really simplify yeah. the kinds of things you were finding at Samus. I'm going to I'm going to go backwards on the images here, but I just wanted to, before we start talking about the show in Southampton, I wanted to to show some of these images. Is it terribly? Yeah. Is there anything we can do? No. It looks great on here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, this is a combination of photographs and, and work, or some idea of the landscape that you encountered. 
And you have talked about other landscapes as well, that, that maybe Afghanistan isn't the only thing that well, you uh, And it's interesting, visually you could, you could confuse West Texas with parts of Afghanistan. Um, but of course, <laughs> you know, the, the rock formations are not dissimilar. But, but of course, as soon as you say it's Afghanistan, it's loaded. And it becomes something which is exoticized because it's very hard to get there. The life insurance cover getting to West Texas is much less. So you, can, you can travel there freely and test whether you, you agree with the assumptions. But where it's Afghanistan, or where it's somewhere like Iraq, or somewhere which has been, our, our understanding has been loaded by a continual media portrayal of conflict, it becomes much harder to engage with it as a real place. Um, which was interesting because even standing there, people would talk about it being a biblical place or being something. So looking beyond through the frame of an armoured vehicle or over the Hesco barricades or from the machine gun ports, you would have 19 year olds spending you know, 18 hours a day staring into the landscape in a way that very few of us ever get the privilege of really staring at a landscape for 18 hours a day. And that they would watch the, the, the way the mountains change colour from the dawn to the dusk because the, many of them weren't able to actually go and walk around the landscape. So your experience would be of the way time manipulates it from a fixed vantage point. There were some really strange kind of relationships with with a country and a landscape without really entering it. It was strange. You brought with you the the view or the, the frame from Britain. From every other conflict it's the same frame, whether it's Bosnia or Iraq or, or Afghanistan. You bring with you your barricades and your 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 helicopters and you view the landscape as the tableau framed within this military structure. And I found it very interesting because although I thought I was looking at Afghanistan, what I was really looking at was the British abroad. I was, I was eating British rationed food, I was with British people, part from Afghan translators, and I was viewing Afghanistan through a window which had been imported with me. So what I'd done is I actually, at Rise North, I'd entered the British military. And officially I never entered Afghanistan on that trip, there's no mark on my passport. I entered the military in Oxfordshire, and I returned from the military in Oxfordshire. And whether I'd been sent to Cyprus or to, because the original intention was to send me to a field hospital in Cyprus, but it was just that I got diverted from Afghanistan. But the, the experience of actually understanding the place you're in is so conditioned by the context in which you arrive. That was why it's so necessary to return, to just question whether it's possible to have any any relationship which undermined that frame. So, now we've talked about the Afghanistan conflict, we've talked about the exhibition that's at the John Hansard Gallery. Um, and in a way, these, all these different exhibitions have, have been a study in, in the way you get to here. And obviously, I'm sure things will develop further, but this is a kind of concluding point for you. And the show at, um, the show at John Hansard Gallery is called Monsters of the Id. Um, and, we kind of, and, and that came, came out of a piece of work that was originally of that site, and we decided it fitted. The whole show. Do you want to say a bit about that? Well, Monster of the Year is the great classic 1960 science fiction film, maybe 50s, I think, which you probably all know, presented the Forbidden Planet. With Leslie Nielsen in one of his few straight parts, and it was, it, it, it's based on the Tempest, and it represents a very, um, a very interesting idea in a rather kind of cheesy um, vehicle for the idea that, of course, that you create your own demons, essentially. So it's based on a kind of Freudian idea of of, of projection of the id, um, but it's also based on on um, Shakespearean um, story of the Tempest. It, I suppose what was interesting in terms of the reference to this exhibition is that there's that classic thing that we all know that by any kind of ethnographer or anthropologist, as soon as they go to actually view something, they change it. As soon as you're standing there with a the camera, you're part of the environment. You're not simply kind of like shielded from it. And it's likely that what you're viewing is not what was there immediately beforehand, and that it's somehow been changed by your presence. Um, what was interesting about this show is that that's kind of, kind of, <laughs> there's no there's no lenses involved. Everything in it is generated in real time, but also the exhibition essentially is responsive, so it wouldn't exist without the audience being there. So in a, in a very kind of like direct way, I suppose, the 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 game engine that runs the show. Is, is through two hacked connect devices, simply measuring if an audience is there, measuring your commitment to the exhibition, and at that point it will begin to divert virtual avatars to engage with you. So it's a, I suppose what's interesting about this show is, although Afghanistan was mentioned in the 
press release, there's nothing about Afghanistan there. Everything is recursive. Everything is about the process of looking. And all of the content within it is generated in the UK at the split second you're watching it. Um, but we are allowed to project from various vantage points our relationship to an entirely, obviously, synthetic environment. And um, I mean, the piece we're looking at at the moment, I mean, just to give a little bit of background, there are four spaces within the John Nansard Gallery, and three of the spaces with the, that have been put together for the Monsters of the Id are networked together. So this idea of the, of the audience entering the space and activating the connect and, and, the, and the various systems that are, that are hooked up to the connect immediately kind of activates the space and changes the way in which it, it begins to operate. And so that without the audience, you kind of don't have a piece of work, or you don't have that, you don't have that relationship with the, 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 the or, or, or things don't happen within the exhibition. When the game engine continues functioning, but the characters that you're viewing on screen would be slightly beyond the horizon. So, well, within the internal logic of the C sharp programming, the you know the inhabitants that you're having a look at here are still quite happily migrating across the landscape. But I suppose the interesting thing is that they would never move to this position without the audience being. We need to explain a little bit more about what was going on, but I think you know, I think the, I think the title of the show is quite important, and then also in relation to this piece, you've drawn from Ray Bradbury as well, haven't you? Yeah, there was a there was, there was a, a great series of short stories by Ray Bradbury that was published in several in several compilations. But I think one of them was the Golden Apples of the Sun. And it was also including the Illustrated Man, and it's a story called The Belt. It also had another name at one point, but The Belt is the most common name. And it's about a children's playroom in the future, where the children um, manage to get given this extraordinary room, which obviously is a precursor to the holiday, where they can project all of their fantasies to enjoy, so that all of the walls become transparent, and they can see whatever landscape they decide to imagine. And the parents become concerned because they seem to continually be creating a, uh, the African belt, and um, they, they they say, why don't you make you know castles and you know kind of or or kind of a beach scene somewhere or whatever? And they, 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 the kids kind of try and you know kind of placate the parents, but every time the parents kind of pop back in, they find the African belt is there again. And in the distance, there are two lions kind of munching on something. Eventually, the parents decide that the whole thing is just too sinister and try and switch off the playroom. And what we find out gradually is that the playrooms become malevolent, and it's not simply as synthetic as they thought. And when a friend comes to visit, they begin to suspect that maybe the lions are eating the parents in the distance. The, I suppose it, it, the wonderful thing about Ray Bradbury's short stories is that they just they provide a very concise way to kind of, um, to digest an allegory of, of American society or of kind of American fears of the future or of kind of like premonitions of certain kinds of ways in which technology might demonstrate our behavioural weaknesses. And I suppose in this case it's a very, very simple game engine that's being programmed compared to any of the titles which my son could get if he was allowed from you know kind of the game store or whatever. It would be it, this would be seen as a very poor quality game. But what's interesting here is that it it provides the tools to create a relationship between audience and landscape, which is entirely controlled and which also um, builds in a set of parameters which as the viewer it's impossible to truly kind of like assess because there's probability at work, there are, there are things beyond the landscape which are causing what you see to happen. And so here we have four people sitting on the bench and the room has been modelled and the fact that they're present yeah, so the connects are, are, are doing a kind of thermal sweep and just recognising that there's something wrong in the room, counting who they are and working out how close they are and how long they've been there. And um, that's caused these others to be distracted from their migration. Yeah, exactly. So the, so if we go into the next room, you can see on your right, you can see the room you've just seen, and then we have the landscape on the left-hand side, in room two in Searchlight 2. The first piece is called Observer Effect, the second piece is called Searchlight 2. And uh, that is actually the landscape on which the entire exhibition is modelled. Yeah, so the inhabitants we're seeing in the curved room here are actually traversing a, a, a mesh which has been scanned from the model of model landscape in room two. It's not derived from Afghanistan, the skies created mathematically, but it's used 
is from a 3D scan of a ton and a quarter of chalk that's been poured in the, um, in, in the second room. Does that make sense? We, we did it, the last time we did this was in the show, so everybody can see it. <laughs> but I don't think this makes but sense. But what was interesting, I suppose, was, was you know, refusing to bring in elements of the exoticized landscape, but instead recreating something which suggested a projection to somewhere else, but was entirely made of the components within the show. By using a ton and a quarter of chalk, with all of the people in the gallery involved with kitchen utensils to make a landscape, by then scanning it, bringing it into the gaming engine, and allowing the, the landscape there to dictate the navigational paths that the characters could take, but also positioning cameras, virtual cameras in this landscape, to create other scenes and other vantage points as a way of testing to see, I suppose, how much we can anthropomorphize something from a distance and from other vantage points regardless of the fact that we know it's forgery at all times. And if we go, that, that's just the space if there's no one in it. So it just proves that um, the, the, the figures did come, come in and out. And then these little dots along here, are the, those are the figures that you've created. And they, they have a sort of adaptive component, don't they? Over, over a period of time, they develop different behaviours. And yeah. part of that is that they come forward into the part of the landscape that you've modelled in the first room. And so you do actually see those figures walking over towards the visitors in the gallery. It's basically an aerial map of a much larger section of the landscape you're viewing in the curved room. And what we're seeing here is what looks like flickering insects, but if you look closely, you see they're actually the same characters, but viewed from a tiny number of pixels that we were watching close up moments before. So those two, are, those two are, are, are now work together. I guess we can talk a little bit more about the technology a bit later. Um, so the third, if you want to explain a little bit about the third space. The, the scale goes from 1 to 1 to 1 to 50 in that landscape to 1 to 500 in this component, um, in which we're, we're, from a little corridor leading off the gallery, we have two doorways. And from each one, you can see the forward and rear view from an aerial vehicle that's rotating around the landscape. Um, it's projected on the inside of hemispheres that are bolted against that false wall. Very good. Yeah. I don't know what pictures we've got. Yeah. Um, and it, it, simply, it simply shows the vantage point of the same landscape from much, much higher up where the sky dominates and where any kind of human activity on the ground is so abstracted that it's impossible to perceive. All we see is the contrails and the, the weather patterns at our height. And then the final space is um, we, we, we take it into a kind of tableau. Yeah, the final space is simply a theatrical room where you have the choice of interpreting it as a rather sinister obsessive that's bought an awful lot of components off eBay and tried to set up a a kind of elite military gaming environment, or it's a deployable field desk which has been dropped anywhere in the world as an instant admin unit, which is actually what it is. It's a mixture of both, in that the desk unit is designed to be pushed off the back of an airplane and assembled in moments to get your administrator exactly into the position you want them to be in. Um, but the joystick can throttle with something which is modelled on military hardware but available for kids to use to control flight simulators. Okay. Um, do you want to just talk, just to sort of wind, wind up, unless you want to talk a little bit about the technology? Yeah. Um, just a little bit about, you know, how how you see this as a kind of conclusion, where you want, where you might go next. I suppose that the, in in this talk, it's a bit strange kind of having this conversation and waking the exhibition. Well, um, I suppose the the thesis behind it is that. And it's something which uh, another artist, Breda Bevan, talked about much more eloquently than I can. It's about the idea that possibly, as observers, sometimes a manipulated version of truth offers a closer experience to the reality of what we might have been engaged with as an idea than actually simply the representation of the, of the light and of the sound that occurred around us at the time. I was interested in the failure of documentary to provide something which my friends and family could um, stand with me and, and understand why I might have changed for a, short, for a while when I came back. As I suppose what I was interested in maybe is that as artists and in, in 
gallery into is the potential for us to attempt to try and form parallel vocabularies which engage with the subplots behind um, the, the, the exoticized tangible primary evidence to maybe kind of get at the ideas which causes anxiety rather than the images which keep that anxiety away from our own personal experience. And I think I'd just like to I'd like just like to add something around the whole sort of process of curating. Um, I've, I I was particularly supportive of this work because it um, it has a sculptural form to it, and it incorporates the interaction in as very much as part of the concept of the work. Um, and very often interaction doesn't doesn't in, it doesn't actually have. You know, doesn't it, it doesn't have, have that kind of level of integration of concept and idea. And also to have the luxury to work in a space like John Hansard <coughs> Gallery that is very understanding and um, you know, very professional. Like, but again, you know, we don't always get that as computer artists and curators. We get given a room in a festival um, for, <laughs> for, for a day you know, or, or whatever. And, and, and it, it's just been fantastic to have this, this level of luxury to show a piece of work on and a professional level for six weeks. Um, I think we probably stop there. I just wanted to um, give you some contact details. Sorry I've been going backwards and forwards, but it's uh, <coughs> useful. The only other thing to say is that there's a conference, Art Image Politics, on the 10th of March. I hope you don't mind me doing this. No. Um, <laughs> at the John Hansard Gallery. Um, there are details on the John Hansard Gallery website, hansardgallery.org.uk, if you'd like to consider it. Thank you.